Welcome everyone. We have people filing in. Welcome to DC Design Week here in Black Designers in Action with Cheryl Miller. We'll get started in just a second. Sonia, welcome, welcome. We'll go ahead and get started because we want to hear as much as we can from Cheryl tonight. So welcome again to DC Design Week and to Black Designers Missing in Action with Cheryl Miller. We're really thrilled to have everyone with us tonight. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function. I'm going to go through just a few intro slides for DC Design Week here, uh, and then we're going to hear directly from Cheryl for most of the hour. So today we are hearing from Cheryl D. Holmes Miller on her experiences as a pioneer in the design field, her contributions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how to address the lack of Black designers in the field today. So thank you again to Cheryl for being with us, and thank you all to join for joining. And before we get started, we just wanted to share some directions on how to turn on live closed captioning. So I'm gonna leave this up for just a second, um, but if you run into any issues with it, again, please feel free to use the chat and we'll help you out directly. All right, and then this event is also being recorded. So if you're uncomfortable with participating in a recorded event or you become uncomfortable at any point, you are welcome to leave the Zoom call at any time. As a virtual event tonight, it's also important for us to touch on some Zoom etiquette tips just to make sure that everyone can participate fully in the event. Uh, if you have any questions for Cheryl, please use the Q&A window. You'll see a specific Q&A box on your Zoom uh, controls. And if you have comments or you wanna chat with other participants or ask us questions, uh, please use the chat section. Uh, we'll be participating there too. Um, and then finally, just like with all AIGA DC events, we are following our strict code of conduct um, and we'll give one warning before removing people in the event they violate this expectation. So practice kindness. And a quick note, DC Design Week is produced by AIGA DC. It's a volunteer run nonprofit organization. Uh, in addition to early access to events like DC Design Week, members also get access to member exclusive events, discounts, and the largest creative community in the DMV. You can find out a little bit more at dc.aiga.org. AIGA DC also runs the Design Continuum Fund Scholarship, and any profit from this year's event will automatically be routed to this fund. You can find out a little bit more about that fund if you're curious on our website. And this week of events was planned and led by a committee of very dedicated volunteers, 28 of them, uh, who've put in tons of work over the last few months to make this possible. Uh, so if you see them pop up on your screen, send them a chat, say thank you uh, for making all of this happen. And this year we also shifted a bit. We shifted our focus to feature events curated and hosted by our community. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different model. We have a lot more community interaction. Uh, we couldn't do this without you, so thank you. 
And we'd also like to give a special shout out to one of our primary sponsors, General Assembly. General Assembly is proud to support DC Design Week. Uh, they're a global tech education company that helps people transition into careers in tech from software engineering, UX design, and data science and analytics to product management and digital marketing. They work hand in hand with DC's design community through its professionals that are part of GA's UX alumni base, instructor roster, and serve as panelists and speakers in GA's classes, workshops, and events. So you can check them out online at General Assembly. Uh, and we'll put a link in the chat there or at uh, their campus downtown. They're located in Chinatown. Uh, so be sure to check them out. And there's a discount code listed here and in your post event email that you'll receive uh, for 20% off classes with GA. So check that out. Give them a follow. And we also wanted to take a moment just to thank this amazing group of sponsors who contributed to help make this week of events such a smashing success. So thank you. Uh, you can learn more about all of these sponsors um, at dcdesignweek.org. And a quick note to accessibility, which is something very important to us. Uh, we're continually committed to ensuring that everyone is able to fully participate in our programming. So you can learn more about what we're doing or if you want to request an accommodation at any point um, at our website, dcdesignweek.org slash accessibility. And a quick plug for a couple of the events still coming up this week. Uh, we have the last remaining few events the next couple of days. Tomorrow we'll have a session with Kelly Sow on how futurists use wide ranging qualitative research, trend analysis, strategic foresight to proactively move toward preferred futures instead of reacting to emergencies. So that'll be a great session. Please join. And then we also have tickets still available for an interactive workshop that, have, that has in-person and virtual options uh, for design professionals who are interested in cultivating an intentional and joyful design process that's dedicated to equity, inclusion, and justice. And that's featuring Raya Veflor. It's tomorrow at 7 p.m. All right, thank you for bearing with me on all of that, all of our announcements. Uh, so I'm happy to now introduce our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Cheryl Miller. She is recognized for her outsized influence within the profession to end the marginalization of BIPOC designers through her civil rights activism, industry expose trade writing, research rigor, and archival vision. Dr. Miller is a national leader of minority rights, gender, race diversity, equality, equity, and inclusion advocacy in graphic design. So Dr. Miller, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna hand the controls over to you. All right, uh, and so thank you so much. Let's uh, do some Zoom tech here, and uh, we're going to start the show. And I will it should come up full screen. There we go. Um, I want to first off um, thank everyone and Washington especially is my hometown. I wanna thank you so much for having me. And um, I uh, am just grateful. I'm grateful to have this opportunity uh, even in spite of uh, it's virtual and Zoom. Um, I want to um, just thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, this is one of my uh, most sought after lectures and I was sharing um, with our conveners before uh, starting that I have some new updates to this particular lecture. Um, I have found, and we can talk about it in Q&A, um, I have found some new history notes that are very compelling that um, I have added to this primary lecture. One of the things that my heart's desire tonight. And every time I now give this lecture, uh, I want you to do something about what I'm gonna show you. Um, adopt a spot. I want us to be better than this lecture. And we can come back and talk about that. But my heart's desire, my, my legacy, my life's work is to show you this history 
so that we all can be together better um, for the industry, for ourselves, for our, our future. Um, we must be better than our past. Uh, this is one big history story that my current work has brought me to the place where I have new information. And this is my first updated lecture of my most popular lecture. Um, where are the black designers? Um, this is an advocacy that has a history. It just didn't pop up on social media. And that's what I wanna show you tonight. Um, I'm best known for um, my corporate communications firm uh, during the civil rights era, storytelling of a socially disenfranchised, marginalized community. I, in New York City, I had a social impact corporate communications design firm. I'm originally from Washington, DC, and I was sharing a little of that background um, beforehand. I, after school, um, I came back to the Washington area and I spent 10 years uh, in local television. And I worked for WTOP, WRC, and I was on the startup team. Um, seven of us put Howard University's Channel 32 uh, on air. And after I completed that, I, I de designed the original uh, 32 WHMM TV logo. Uh, after we, I think it was about two years into the project, after it went on air, I moved to New York City. And um, this is where I picked up um, my my advocacy in um, in in a in a in an intentional way, uh, and this is where the um, firm became um, popular for social impact corporate communications. I went to art school, um, and I felt it was really important that in order to be competitive, that I would be specific in my education. So with that, um, you can go to my Wikipedia and see every place where I've been, but I've been to every, almost every art school on the Northeast corridor I've been to. And so, uh, and then uniquely, I think the place that has given me an edge as a trade writer and this uh, design social justice work is um, I studied um, revisionist his, history and developing scholarship um, at Union Theological Seminary. And so my Master of Divinity work um, improved my writing and my scholarship and my history storytelling and all of it came together. Design in and of itself um, showed me a problem and my work at Union showed me a solution. So together we, we have this legacy work, um, but I went, to, I went to art school. Uniquely, very uniquely, I was raised African-American, but I am really, really, really genuinely BIPOC. I have all these people behind me over here. I have four grandparents of four different races from four different places. That's kind of my motto with that. Four, four grandparents, four different places, four different races. Um, and um, I am, they call me the OG BIPOC. I'm really BIPOC. <laughs> Okay, I was raised African American in DC. I was teasing. I said, you know, I can come, come, come down and give hand dance lessons and go, 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 and show you all how to crack crabs. <laughs> but in my house and in my home and in my heritage, I'm BIPOC. Most uniquely is um, this incredible uh, story of my mom, um, my maternal lineage. I am a derivative work from the Danish, specifically the Danish and Ghanaian slave trade. Um, and uh, my family is indigenous to the Danish West Indies, which now Carnival Cruise, if it can, if it can get there, <laughs> is the US Virgin Islands. And uh, what we're looking at is um, a picture, um, the middle right, that's my mom who is um, Filipino. And you say, how in the world? It's World War I story, I've done my family. Um, indigenous family heritage work. I have a memoir and we, I was just born into this crazy ma maternal mystery. And so that's my mom and my grandmother um, above and below um, is my Ghanaian descent great grandmother. So my, my grandmother was half and that, that's her mom above her. And below 
is my uh, Afro-Caribbean um, cousin who was, uh, went back to Ghana and all of my family work, my DNA, these are my chiefs and we're all from Accra and the story of the slave trade into St. John's and um, my family mixing and matching. And ultimately my grandmother um, mixed and matched with a Filipino who came to the island World War I. This all kind of convened uh, on Howard's campus. Um, my dad um, was a uh, generation, uh, I'm fourth generation, I think third or fourth generation Washingtonian. Um, and his family migrated up from Fauquier County, Virginia. He, my, 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 my paternal lineage, I'm white and American Indian. That's my great grandmother there. That's my, grand, my grandfather. Um, that's, his, that's his grandmother. And so this family from Virginia, my grandfather is white and American Indian and my paternal grandmother is African American. And they all met, and that's my mom. I call her my Asian Island mom, okay? Um, it's a whole nother story how World War I brought my Filipino grandfather into the Danish West Indies. Um, and all of it collided on Howard's campus. They met on Howard's campus. I am a, a mid-century um, child of the, um, the pre, during, and post-civil rights era. I, I was born right when the streetcars were still on F Street. And on a good day, they made folks of color ride in the back. <laughs> That's how DC I am, okay? Um, and uh, influenced early technology, um, radio shows were, were still, you would listen. And then they had this new phenomena of black and white TV, uh, Mickey Mouse Club, early, early Walt Disney, and you all had Bob Ross and I had John Nagy, did car charcoal drawings. I was influenced by um, the uh, Alma Thomas and Afro Cobra starting at Howard and Colorfield School at Hirshhorn and all these things. And I won my first award um, December 16th, 1962. I was a Girl Scout and I won uh, a, my first award and I ended up in the Washington Post. And all of this is going on um, through the civil rights era. Um, this is our, our, our history. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I want you to understand this, that Jim Crow was a major obstacle to the African-American community wanting to um, study art. This is an example of um, a gentleman, Mr. Norris, uh, wanted to go to Micah in 1947. He tried to sue the school. Uh, they wouldn't let him in, and um, they tried. He tried to sue them because he was contending they're taking, they're taking money, federal money, government money. He should be able to. Um, I think he was a veteran. It's you know this is a well documented um, story that just comes down to we couldn't go to school. Jim Crow made it near impossible. Um, there are cases where we could get in, but mostly we were kept out. And um, I believe Mr. Norris lo lost this case, but he sued um, in 1947. So I, I really want you to know that this is an era where um, the African-American community was kept out intentionally. Jim Crow, it was a law and much of what we experience in a residual community was taught, taught and punished if it didn't keep us out of the business. I want you to understand that. There was, this was a law that kept us from performing in the arts and especially commercial art. This is a friend. This is Ted, Ted Shearer. I know Mr. Shearer, he's passed on now and his son. They were both, um, one, they were photographers. Um, Mr. Shear was a cartoonist. Um, I want you to know that Jim Crow, until 1968, when the laws were repealed, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that it left our hearts, but the main purpose 
was to legalize and marginalize African Americans and to establish white people as above black people. This is with intentionality. Okay, and by the time we get to the end of this, I'm gonna show you the reason why. And in my work now is I want you to fight against this because there's still residual of this in what we experience and what we experience in our industry and in our association and in our hearts. It's still, in many cases, it lingers, it lingers and it must, I find it by telling you the truth. These gentlemen were kept out. 1953, Ted Shear writes an article for New York Age Defender. I would give him, 1953, I would give him the first recorded in one place history of black graphic designers as of 1953, he records in this article and he calls out names. So when we're doing our research and we wanna know that this is an era that's transitioning, transitioning, transi transitioning right out of the Harlem Renaissance, he calls Aaron Douglas, Elmer Stoner, um, E. Symbols Campbell with um, Esquire. Uh, he's listing everybody he knows as of 1953, he's listing everyone that he knows per, primarily in New York City and or working for a major advertising agency or um, freelancing or something. He's, he's, he lists out the Negro artists of his era. This is a recorded list. For those of you that want to do this history and your blogs and your, you know, your articles and you this, that, and the other. And that's my work is to pull some of this stuff out of the card catalogs because Google only takes you to, you know, 28 days you ought to know, the, you know, 13 you ought to know. No, I've lived through the history and I know that things sitting in the card catalogs. And that's what my work is now. I'm, I'm, I'm um, collecting from uh, heirs, um, collections from families and we're pulling them into um, the history of North America, graphic design in North America at Stanford University. I'm collecting family ephemeral to get um, our story out of boxes and basements um, into a database so that the next generation can begin to write the history books. Mr. Shear, who I know, I knew him. He wrote this article in 1953, and he, he listed everybody that he knew at that time. And what's interesting is he cites Aaron Douglas. And so this is an era that's coming out you know, of the Harlem Renaissance. But he's telling, he's, he, he, and there's one woman here he, he names, um, Louise Jefferson, art director for Friendship Press. You can, you can find all, all, all of these things and you can write me, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, the, articles, the articles are there. 1953 moves into an era um, similar to where we are. This is cyclical. History has a tendency to repeat itself in 50 years. A major event that begins to somewhat straighten out uh, the Negro lack of representation in um, the commercial art, which is what it was called, uh, era. And in spite of, there are a few that Mr. Sher has documented in this article. That's, just, that's one of the first history notes, that article. We, we, we get to a turning point in the civil rights era. Um, Martin Luther King is is assassinated. Um, everybody bounces up and down 14th Street like it's brand new. But I want you to know, in 1968, this is what 14th Street looked like, and U Street. You you didn't you didn't walk this street. Starbucks sure wasn't there. And after Martin Luther King was assassinated, they, they blew up everything. I grew up through this. So the next time you wanna have 
Starbucks at 14th and P. <laughs> Think about this. Think about this. I want you to know this. This is the era of black nationalism and black pride. 1968, they killed Martin Luther King and Washington really was never the same. Just sit with it. Just sit with it. Because this is a pivotal point of truth in understanding how my community of designers were disenfranchised. Just sit with it. Because I sat with it as a teenager. Black lives have always mattered. This is Emory Douglas, AIGA medalist, 2015, 1968, his archives, his collection of Black Panther graphics. Now he's revered. If you hear a lecture, he takes you around the world where he shows you his graphics of the era. AIGA medalist, em Emory Douglas, 2015, he's a peer. We were there. In 1968, a woman by the name of Dorothy Jackson wrote for a print magazine. See, it's something about when a black man gets murdered in the community, all of a sudden everybody starts trying to make reparations and make things right. And the first place of the advocacy looking for us, looking for us, is Print Magazine writes this article in 1968, written by Dorothy Jackson, who is um, an English academician in Manhattan. She writes this article where she's featuring and talking to five black graphic designers out of New York City about the lack and relatively few black designers in the field. This is the place where all of a sudden the industry starts kind of looking for us. Why are we missing? We're missing because Jim Crow stole portfolios and refused to let us, refused to let us participate. And Ted Shear writes and tells us that in 1953. And here we are in 1968 and reparations start rolling out. The industry starts writing whip. What can we do? Where are they? Why, why are there so few? And this is one of the first articles, Black Experience in Graphic Design. You can Google it and get it. On Hayes's early important, this is Dorothy Hayes, okay? And she's one of the first Black women in New York City, mid-century, who's going to make a dent in this story and helps us with our history. I was employed by a well-known broadcasting company and led to believe that I would hold a design position that I was never allowed to do anything but non-creative work. I was frankly told that my employment was simply a form of tokenism. 1968, our primary um, graphic design magazine, there were two or three of them. They would come hard copy, print magazine and communication arts magazine, okay? and. They started asking this question, where, where are the black designers? Why are they missing? All of a sudden, Martin Luther King is assassinated and everybody's looking for us. And Ted Shear in 53 tells us, here are the ones I know, and this is why there's no presence because you won't let us in. This is serious. This is serious history that in our generation and in our living and in my work, let's not repeat. And I want you to understand the cruelty of this and adopt a spot into our future, our associations, our practices, you know, our teams that we're on. We can, we can stop this mindset. We can be better than our past. CA starts asking, well, how many black Americans will graduate from our school this year? Well, it's a good question if you can get them in. 
1968. 1969, print allows, um, allows Dorothy, uh, She's in a colors of state of mind. Uh, it's kind of a single theme portfolio. Um, it's one of her first appearances in print magazine, 1969. She is one of the, um, there are about four or five major uh, female black women in New York of the era. Um, she and her girl, she and about three or four other girlfriends. Okay, they're the only women at the time. Okay, I'm not the first woman, to, I'm not the first one in New York City. She and her girlfriends are, are, are in front of me. October 23, 1969. This is from um, the New York Times. And all of a sudden there's this, we have to use black talent if we can find it. And, um, here, here it's, let's see, the chairman of the American Association of, of Advertising, he's giving us a charge. He gave a charge in 1969 and he's giving us a charge today. Um, for the future of the black man in advertising is in two sets of hands. He said yours and his. His drive, his effort, his striving can be encouraged by you or discouraged. You can help or hinder. You can confront the situation or avoid it. You can build bridges or you can build walls. This lingers as a charge into our lives even today. This is going on. All this is going on. And in 1969, I'm a senior at Calvin Coolidge High School. And that's my art teacher who says to me, Cheryl, you're never gonna make it. Good old Miss Glassman, may she rest in peace being wrong. <laughs> DC Public Schools, Calvin Coolidge High, Miss Glassman, my art teacher. There were two of us. Two art teachers, one Miss Snowden and Miss Glassman, one black, one white, two art rooms with an art closet between the two of us. Two kids wanted to be professional, one white, one black. And this woman says to me, I'm gonna do everything I can do to keep you out of Rhode Island School of Design and you will never be an artist. Thank you, Miss Glassman. Thank you, Calvin Coolidge High. If I listened to her, I wouldn't be here, you listening to me today. Coolidge wouldn't, I find it out in all of my research, Coolidge wouldn't send my transcript to RISD. My father, big shot, trying to be mayor of Washington, had to call up and shake the school down to get my transcript out. And Ms. Glassman doing everything she can do to keep me out because she wants her student to go to Rhode Island School of Design. I've been fighting this since I was 16 years old. I've been at this over 50 years. Little did I know that Ms. Hayes was putting together, she's 15 years older than I am. I didn't know that she was putting together a show in New York City. And the point of her show is we exist. New York, you don't have to look all around. I'm gonna, my friends and I, we're gonna put on a show. And she and Eli Cantor, Eli Cantor is the son of Saul Cantor, uh, Gallery 303, co Composing Room, New York City. It's incredible. I'm working through her collection and her archives and she's telling me exactly what's going on. She's putting together a show. She's curating a show with her friends to show New York City 49. Don't, don't act like we're missing. I'm gonna show you 49 competitive black designers, 1960. I'm going to college. I didn't even know that this drama was happening. I wanna thank um, 
credits for Stanford collections. I'm going to be lecturing more of um, um, the show at the Postal House in New York at toward the end of October. Um, Dorothy's archives have come into Stanford. They're processing. And this is a picture of, uh, of the show, the exhibit, I think, special collections. There's a note at the end of this lecture. Um, it's being in, pro it's in process now. And um, you'll be able to uh, read and get more history notes on this show. We're looking at a very important piece of ephemeral. The purpose of the show was to exhibit advertising and publishing industries and businesses that a vast reservoir of talent, which is black designers being used, misused or underused. The show was put together at the end of 1969. I'm trying to, my father says to me, Cheryl, what's your plan for college? And I come up with Rhode Island School of Design. I had no idea that this drama, trauma drama was going on. And I would, all I wanted to do was paint and draw pictures. And I didn't know I was stepping on the path, one treacherous path that Jim Crow at every turn obstructed, aborted, abused, misused, people who could have been my mentors, who could have held my hand, who could have helped me. We're looking at a very important piece of history right here. Bottom left, George Olden. He's best known as one of the first black art directors for CBS, but at this time, he's Vice President McCann Erickson. Eli Kenter, board, chairman of the board of the composing room. Dorothy E. Hayes, Herb Blue Ballin. For all of you who have studied Herb Blue Ballin, typographer. Sidney Minson, typographer. And Mailer on the end is Mailer Ryder. I was hoping that he would teach me painting at RISD. I went to RISD to paint. In my freshman year, I found out my father was dying and I never returned after my freshman year, I went to go study with him to find myself at MICA studying design. Bottom right is a picture of um, Dorothy Hayes and Eli Cantor. And I, this is an incredible piece of ephemeral that documents 49 um, astute black graphic designers with a mission to answer, where are the black designers? And Dorothy said, let me show you where they are. I had no idea that Rhode Island School of Design, this is a document from their, their, um, um, from their archives, a newsletter, student takedown. We think stu student takedowns in our school are new. Rhode Island School of Design was one of the first, 19, 1970, okay? The, let, the students are demanding diversity. I get an admissions. I'm a part of the minority recruiting program. I land as a freshman Rhode Island School of Design as in response to a student takedown. <laughs> we want more diversity. I had no idea that I was walking into this. And Mailer brought the show um, to the school. April, April 2nd, I believe, 1970. Um, see, I'm old enough to have lived this history and young enough to remember it and bold enough to tell you the truth of it. I was, there was a kid in this and RISD, the kids were demanding. You think these schools are demanding on Instagram now? It, these, these students, 1970, after Martin Luther King was assassinated. See, what they did was, all the schools came and offering reparations and opening up all the Ivy Leagues. They came down to Washington and New York and Philadelphia and invited us all to go to school. I had, I had invitation. I said I could have gone to Wellesley. Um, I'm out of the era of um, Hillary Clinton. I could have gone English lit and writing. I went to RISD to the right. <laughs> I could have gone to the left. All right. And this is what they did in Washington. They came for us and they brought us up. Uh, they brought us up into New England and gave us opportunity to go to school. 
they let start letting us in. But the ones who were there at RISD began to press, we need diversity. And one of the first things they did, they brought Dorothy's show in. Uh, April 1970, the show was documented by Communication Arts. And um, Communication Arts, I, I, they have republished Okay, see, my work is getting things out of the card catalog, okay? Everything wasn't Googleable. So I'm like, let me, let me try to remember things that aren't searchable, that are in card catalogs. This is a vintage volume 12, number two, 1970 communication arts, and it documents the show. See that? Okay. Um, it now has been, it's now been republished on the web. I found it today and I have talked to the publishers in months gone, previous months. This is a history book. Can you put it online because you can't get, you can't get the magazine anymore. All right. Uh, you may be on eBay. There might be a few few copies that you can buy from the publisher, this vintage. So this has just been, if you, if you follow me on LinkedIn or Instagram, you can Google this now. This whole article CA has put up online. This, this is your history book. This is the next history book after Ted Shearer's history book, which was in the article. All right, this is your history book. 49 New York graphic designers, five women, and the balanced men. And they were curated into this show um, to say, we're, we're present, stop looking, we're here. In an effort to support and advocate for other black designers like yourself, Hayes teamed with book designer Joyce Hopkins in 1970 and Eli Cantor, they both, I've been reading her memoirs and, and, and her articles in her collection. And painstakingly, she explains how Eli Cantor, they almost have this idea together to put together a show to show the New York design community that the black designers exist. Into an exhibit entitled Black Artists and Graphic Communication. It appeared, it had, it had, a, it had a trajectory, um, a travel log. Um, it appeared in response and Mailer was in the show. He was a professor of painting. He brings the show in um, to um, Woods Gary Mansion, April 2nd to April 13th. And this, the show traveled. Her notes um, tell us uh, where else it traveled, but it traveled um, to uh, April 1970. And I'm getting my admissions. In other words, imagine I'm a kid, I'm waiting for Rhode Island to tell me I got in. I didn't know all of this was going on. I'm like, oh my God. All I knew was Miss Glassman was trying to keep me out. Okay, doing everything I could, she could do to keep me out from going to one of the best art colleges in North America. And I'm, I'm, I'm fighting Coolidge to get my transcript out so I can go to school. I didn't know that I was walking into a major battle, let alone a war. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, where are the black designers history? It just did not pop up on Instagram. These fractals have been, I'm so happy that I'm able to uh, explain the fractals and Dorothy's work now at Stanford, which is being um, processed. Uh, it's, it's, you wanna see the whole show, She's got enough documentation to show you the whole show. But up until now, these little fractals with no explanation, no history, wandering around the internet. And this particular piece is in, about the show is in Japanese. Who can read Japanese? Our history is in Japanese, okay? But thank God um, her archives have been collected. And Dorothy tells me each and every night as I'm going through her, going through things that I can see in the collection to help identify and to process. She tells me the story 
of this incredible history book that she's left us. I leave Washington in 1982 and I give you this marker because I want you to understand our community. I ended in New York City in 1982. I left Howard and you he hear me always talk. I, my husband finished business school and got a job in New York and came home. He says, you wanna move to New York? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And the whole story about how I came into New York and all that, I've gotten lectures and we can come back but here, my community of designers um, started dying. This is the era of Halston, Basquiat, Warhol, and they called it a rare cancer seeing 48 homosexuals, pneumonia strikes gay men. They called it the grid, kind of like contact tracing we're doing now. They called it the grid. Okay, so they try to figure out, okay, who were you with? Blah, 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 blah. And then before, before it became AIDS and HIV, it was called the grid. 1982 is the beginning of this. And God bless, I lost my friend, Michael Gass, who was the first art director for um, Carolyn Jones. That's a whole nother story about how I met him and you know, they wanted me to take his job at ABC Local and he was leaving um, ABC Local to go help Carolyn Jones uh, with the first, one of the first black advertising agencies in New York City, Mingo Jones. I lost my stylist, my hairstylist. And as I was leaving, my, my, one of my, my artists at Howard was bold and he, he, he moved with his partner. I don't know whether he's alive or not now, but Back then it was a bold move. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move in and make a home and a family with my partner. But my friends in New York started dying. Trials and the design community, pneumonia strikes. It was strange, it was mysterious. It was called the grid. In 1985, I found my way to Pratt I said, I don't know how long I'm going, I'm a corporate wife. I don't know how long I'm going to be in New York. But by this time, again, I'd have to zoom in how to break into New York and how not to break into New York from a local market. Okay, I wrote, I wrote this infamous Pratt thesis, 1985. I finished, um, I enrolled at Pratt's um, uh, master's program. I, they gave me half of the program on my experience, told me to take, classes, pay the tuition. I took business classes. And when I got to the end, they said, I don't know what they told anybody else. They said to Cheryl Miller, no design project for you. That's kind of easy because I've been a design award-winning soul my whole life. So there was like, oh no lady, easy in for you is not easy out. You're going to make a contribution to your industry. And that's what I did with this document. And you will hear me always talk. Uh, I picked up, um, I asked them, um, uh, Dr. Leslie King Hammond to be my major reader. I began writing and starting my scholarship here and it got published by print magazine. And even in this dispensation of work, I discovered um, Joel Peter Johnson who won the cover, a young black student won the print magazine student contest of the year, a black man did this infamous co cover. No one knew he was black. And his story is, my article is in this particular edition. You can get it on eBay <laughs> if you can find it. Okay, I have a few copies. There are a few of them. I, I understand you can, get them on, you can get them on eBay. But his story of winning the student contest, I recently interviewed him um, to discover that he was a young, um, black illustrator and as a student won the student competition which promised the cover. This is um, one of the most um, infamous print <laughs> magazine with this article of mine um, that was published from, um, you can hear me talk about the story of how I believed in that thesis so much. I went over to print and said, I want a magazine article. Uh, I want a feature article. 
and Martin Fox, I'll never forget, gave me an editor, a contract and a check. And um, I always shout out to Tom Goss, who's my first editor. He said, Cheryl Miller, if you couldn't design, you wouldn't be in New York. He says, everybody designs in New York. You keep writing, you keep doing this. This is what you'll be known for. And they published me. And uh, just recently uh, I met Joel and he said, Cheryl, I'm in that infamous magazine. I'm on page, blah, blah, blah. It's in, behind my article. And he says, I won the cover that year. And uh, if you can find it on eBay, get it. Um, I, um, my journey with AIGA, um, Michelle Washington uh, was one of the writers for out of New York for one of the, des the design journeys, which promoted, began to promote um, BIPOC designers um, and, and designers who were contributing, but they weren't medalists yet, if you will, but very, very active. And so you can read those design journeys. Uh, she was one of the authors of many of the journey profiles. Um, and she wrote about me uh, in the 1980s. So I've been working on this a long time, guys. <laughs> you know, an overnight success that took 50 years. <laughs> all, the, all the way from dancing in the park, okay? <laughs> so ooh, I can only tell you that you have to persevere through this. This is the history. So um, AIGA started um, um, noting my work. And I, I, I have a design journey profile that began to document um, my story. From the article was one of the catalysts um, for the DNI committees that was started in 19, 1990. Everyone who started the first DNI um, forum for AIG in New York, um, um, they uh, are noted in uh, this particular newsletter, AIG 1990. Uh, why is graphic design 93% white, 1991? Everybody's looking, they're still looking, all right? This has a history, okay? Just stay with me here. Um, and I become um, keynoting AIJ judge. I'm writing, I become a trade writer. My articles are advancing all through um, the industry on this new level of um, national attention from my writing. Um, in 2015, Maurice Cherry, um, he, he formalizes Black Designers Missing in Action. He is the author and finisher of the title, Where Are the Black Designers? Maurice Cherry um, asked this question in a presentation and where I focus on footnotes and scholarship, he works with data and statistics. And uh, he gave, this is on YouTube, you can find it. Um, he, he talks about why we're missing statistically. In this, pre this presentation, which was originally given SXSW Interactive 2015, Maurice um, begins to tell this story and integrates my timeline into a continuing timeline into the 90s. I'm taking you from 1953, they're looking for us. And here's Maurice now, the end, the end of the 20th century. He's, where are we? And he's picking up the history and he's telling it in his documentary. And then he writes, where are the black designers? In 2016, um, Print calls me for a quote. And I said, why give you a quote? Let's do an update. And I write again, black designers still missing in action. And I give another commentary on State of the Union. Uh, meanwhile now, Jerry has started um, Revision Path, which you can hear his podcast every week, every month, uh, whatever his cycle is. And he features um, black designers. He wants everybody to know where they are uh, and the, the, um, the designers of your generation and what exciting podcast. Um, he gets collected into the Smithsonian African American Museum, 11 of his podcasts. His interview with me, um, number 248, is collected at the Smithsonian, Revision Path. Um, he documents us, um, gener Generation Z. He's doc documenting each in, in his cycle of podcasts. I'm number 248, I tell my story. We're collected uh, at the Smithsonian. Uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, 
here we go again, 50 years, Black Lives Matter. And all of a sudden, where are the Black designers goes viral on Instagram. A bold new initiative demands answers. There's nothing bold and new. It's been going on my whole life and the life of my friends before me. All the way, you gotta know this history. This is not new just on Instagram, okay? Is the technology forged it forward, all right? And I write in my last articles here for print, I explain how this happened. It went viral. After 50 years, the advocacy went viral on Instagram. So look at this trajectory. Dorothy Hayes, and, and even before that, 1953, Ted Shearer, um, 70, Dorothy Hayes, 85, I write my thesis, 87, I'm published, 1991, AIG starts diversity, uh, 15, 16, Maurice is asking questions, 2016, I write again, 2018, Stanford comes for my collection, and then I start the history with my friends, I start the history of Black graphic designers at Stanford, we have collections coming in from all over the place, 2019, Cherry gets collected, 2020, uh, where the Black designers goes viral, and 2020, um, an ally pledge to the advocacy takes hold, other people are helping to get us out of this situation. That's all the way from Jim Crow guys. Okay, part four, I write again, just published October 20, and I start talking about the history uh, and the erasure of the slave artisan. I give you in my articles, the story of the slave artisan who really can just be found right down in Williamsburg. And the website, um, explains the history of the slave artisan. And one of my key points from W.E.B. Du Bois and his scholarship on the Negro artisan is that the fear of Negro competition after slavery as a competitive workforce is what the systemic racist practice is. White men were scared of black men who sought to enter into the artisan realm, the typesetters, the printers, okay? They did everything they could do to keep and annihilate us out the business. W.E.B. Du Bois and his scholarship and sociological findings tell us exactly the systemic racist practice that sought to annihilate the black man out of this business, up out of slavery. Um, you can read this article, my notes, my footnotes and scholarship. Um, I, curiously, the gentleman who, who gives you um, the tour of the print shop in Williamsburg tells you the story of the runaway slave who made his own ads in the print shop <laughs> in Williamsburg. Uh, this is Amos Kennedy who on vacation, he was a computer tech executive. He went, he, he went, he didn't even realize, I talked to him real, recently. He went to Williamsburg decades ago and he was inspired by the slave artisan, gave up his computer job and started letterpress. And here he is now, a passion for letterpress. You can see his documentaries on YouTube. If you hear that he's lecturing, I shared with him, I said, Amos, do you realize that you were inspired on that vacation trip by the slave artisan, okay? And his journey from Africa into the print shops in colonial Williamsburg and you went on vacation, walked away from your computer tech job to give a lifetime and passion to um, a craft um, mastered by the slave artisan. So his work, he's a letterpress um, um, printer and what an incredible story. I connect with him, he lectures. If you see him lecturing and if you see Emory Douglas lecturing, you wanna go. Um, I always say, I'm not new to this, I'm true to this. I've been doing this since 1970, just trying to go to art school. Black designers, we're found in action. Um, all of my work is at, uh, my professional archives are at the Cheryl Miller Collection at Stanford, uh, special libraries, and now we're collecting the history of Black graphic designers. I'm going around to all the families, you know, of, that I know. I want ephemeral, I want it all in one place, and Stanford has um, 
committed to preserving our work and getting it into an academic day. I'm not going to write all the books for all this stuff. You guys will. <laughs> but you got, we got to get it out of the card catalogs. We have to get it out of oral tradition and we have to get the facts out. Um, this is, you know, um, uh, my corporate communications work um, for Fortune 500 and national African-American organizations developed after the civil rights era. Cheryl Miller Design was out in New York. So I, I, I um, frustrated with some of the drama in New York. I opened up my own firm. I knew business and I had contacts and so forth. And so I had a real good run um, with a design firm in New York City. Uh, that was after my, uh, my uh, broadcast career uh, in Washington. Um, citations um, today, uh, I wanna give honor to um, uh, Stanford University Libraries, Dorothy Lee Hayes collection. My collection is there. We're bringing in, um, uh, I don't even have the full list, but um, all of it is being prepared so people can begin um, to research and read the documents. I'm following Ida B. Wells. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. My work is just to tell you the truth, no fake news. Everything I'm showing you today is a footnote, is a piece of scholarship. It's oral tradition that's been recorded, um, no hearsay. And um, um, I've had a lot of help. People pass me things. It's almost like, you know, law of attraction. I'm looking for one thing and all of a sudden all of the research and all I'm doing is putting it together. I'm not writing all this. I have a couple of books I'm working on that belong to Cheryl Miller, but all of this that I'm putting is to put in an academic base so the next um, scholars can begin to do the revisionist work, the decolonizing work and to write our history. And you can't do it unless you have the, you, you have the footnotes and the research. And so that's what we're doing, putting it all in one place. So you can um, do more than just Google a few names. Um, my husband has been with me since I was 16 years old. We went to Coolidge together. He was a class president. He's been with me on this crazy thing. He figured out, he said, Cheryl, you are the only designer not the only one who's won both the Cooper Hewitt and the AIGA. Okay, there might be about seven or eight others who won both of the major design awards, but five and 10 years apart. He said, Cheryl Miller, you're the only one that's won them in the same year. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy. Everybody says, Cheryl, well-deserved. And one said, Cheryl, me and Debbie Allen, hard earned. And I'm like, yes, I had no one. And so I've been here for you. And that's the history of this advocacy and my work. May something today inspire you to adopt a spot to stop and eradicate any residual leftover of an untruth of Jim Crow who sought to steal, abort, and frustrate the black creative in this business because white men were scared to compete with the slave artisan who became free. That is the truth, my friends. And the only way out of this and through this to a better tomorrow for all of us is to join an ally movement, to be, to show up for these organizations, to stand up in it, on your job, to compete. My father said to me, Cheryl, if this before he died, he left me money to go to school. He said, Cheryl, you know, Make sure you have your academics, but if you're gonna do this, be the best. Well, Pop, I don't know whether I've, I'm the best, but I've done it in excellence. And that's what I want for you today, is to tackle this in excellence, adopt a spot, and don't repeat any of this history in your practice, in your co with your colleagues, um, wherever you stand, make a difference to stop any residual that would make anyone ask, where are the black designers? That's your history. That's Cheryl Miller. I thank you, DC. I'm telling you, I'm waiting to come down and give you all some hand dance and some go-go lessons and show you all how to crack cat crabs. Until then, do what you know to do. Compete and be the best. Not always perfect, but in excellence. That's Cheryl Miller. Let's stop, take some questions. I hope you enjoyed that. No fake news, the truth. Cheryl, thank you so much. That was so great. Um, I know I can say on behalf of all of us that we deeply appreciate you being here and sharing your story. 
Uh, we do have a couple of questions ready for you. So if folks can hang on, we have some good questions. Um, okay. And if you have any additional, please drop them in the Q&A box, but we'll get started with this one. Uh, what has been the most memorable or impactful piece you've collected so far for your collection at Stanford? This is, uh, it's not released yet. This is Dorothy Hero's, I mean, Dorothy Hayes' binder. Okay, and her binder, um, her binder uh, is her notebook of this curated show. And she writes in her notes, that 30 days before the show, one of the curated artists falls to his death. And I'm like, who is this missing artist who was supposed to be in the show, who committed suicide and fell out of a window? And I found him, Moselle Thompson. 1953 to 1969, LP cover illustrations, the story of this man lost and hidden. And Dorothy tells me in her notes, oh my God, Moselle fell out a window and committed suicide 30 days before the show. And I get on a trail to find Moselle Thompson and his story, to find an incredible story of erasure. And see, when you do this kind of scholarship, you don't look, they're not, they don't write about us. So the things you have to look for, I, I learned this in, in theology, studying theology, is forensic work. You, you don't look, you don't research in obvious places, okay? You, you look for answers to questions that people don't even think. I found this guy and look at this catalog of work. This is, this in the center spread of this tabloid is a list of all of the album covers that he um, produced for RCA Vinyl. His whole archive and collection and his, his photos are at, Photos, Negro photographer in the uh, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon archives documents, because he's from Pittsburgh. Look, I find this stuff not where you think you would find it because the white, the white designers aren't, the publisher, they're not writing about us. Unless a black man is assassinated, they're not looking for us. And I found so compelling is in Dorothy's notes, that I'm going through helping to identify and label and, and look and, you know, it's gonna be released. You just write Stanford in the next couple of weeks. They're, they're giving it out for you. I'm not writing, <laughs> I'm finding, okay? All right, you guys are gonna write. All right, and she writes, he, this guy flies out the window, he kills himself. I mean, it's a whole story, okay? A whole story. And I find him missing in action, out of history and this incredible. Parsons, Scholastic Art winner, okay, and the whole story of why he commits suicide 30 days before this show. Okay. Wow. So on that's the top, listen, to date, to date, that's about the most compelling one <laughs> from the grave. And on the topic of finding Cheryl, we have a question um, from Elizabeth. Given these successive ways of searching for black designers, how optimistic are you that this time things will be different or better for the next generation? Well, I'm sorry, I was reading the chat. Can you ask me again, please? Sure, yeah. Given the successive waves of searching for black designers, how optimistic are you that this time things will be different or better for the next generation? Well, it has to be, it has to be because you know, up until now, it's been this erasure. We don't exist. Where are we? Where are we? You know, and it starts with just Cherry's recording every week of all, I mean, the multiplication. I want to do, you know what? I want to do a new um, uh, uh, census because we're not recording. We're not like, like 
like it's everybody's struggling to wear masks and get vaccinated. We're, we're not taking the surveys. I would dare say there are far more percentage of us in this industry if we will raise our hands and take, you know, I'm, I'm talking about creating Cheryl's survey. Take Cheryl's survey. I want to know everybody. I want to know everybody. You're going to find, okay, to document how many of us really, really exist. And then my thing is we have so many of us now that are in the, uh, Academy of Learning, PhDs, and you know all kinds of disciplines that are incredible with design. This database that I'm doing everything I can do to gallop through, it's sacred work because I talk to families that have lost loved ones and there's, they're, they're, they're things, their belongings are in boxes in the basement. And I'm, I, and I'm pleading with families to donate the boxes because the history is in your dad's box, in your mother's box and let Stanford preserve it. And so once we get all of this into a form, it's going to be up to the next generation to do the revisionist critical race theory work and my work is i there's no fake news to cheryl miller you know i footnote and write as i go <laughs> okay but i want to I, I yes i want designers but i need laborers of phds and writers and those who will come to the table and knocking on publishers doors and saying okay when's the next edition okay when's the next edition I want to contribute. Okay, so my my legacy is built on my scholarship and my writing. I'm a writer. Okay, and it just so happens I have something to write about. <laughs> okay, so I didn't learn this in design school. I learned the problem in design. Okay, but my theological work and my social justice training and scholarship, okay, it taught me how to create solution of design social justice. Okay, and so with that said, I'm encouraging, and my first editor said, Cheryl, the designer is a dime a dozen. Right, right, right. I'm leaving a trail of what to write with, okay? And so it will change, and telling the truth, like Ida B. Wells says, telling consistently the truth. I'm telling you the truth. W.E.B. Du Bois, look at footnote. He tells you the truth. It's just not pretty infographics that are floating around now in design conversations. It's his sociological data and work, the erasure. Okay, your, fir your, first, your first women designers, Spelman College, their press. Tell the truth and be unapologetic about it and the wheel will turn. We have a genealogy. We didn't just, I'm from nowhere, from nobodies. And some of my truths are zingers. I'm all, all over LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. Every other day, I've got a zinger. Okay? And when I talk to you about one of my favorites, outstanding, Aaron Douglas. We think Aaron Douglas designed that Art Deco stuff. That's Weinhall Rice, a German immigrant out of the Bauhaus movement, World War I. He plops himself down into into Harlem, he teaches Aaron Douglas this style, this German expression, the style. And we, and we go around thinking one thing and it's Reinhold Rice. Okay, go to, my, you, go to my YouTube. There's a lecture from Harvard where Reinhold Rice, Reinhold Rice, it's a lecture about him and you will see all of the Art Deco. He's the father of the, of the design. He's the, and he taught Aaron Douglas, okay? And so it's these kinds of revisionist facts that you must know in order to do the next level of work to challenge even, um, look, I'm after the main history books here. I'm after the main history books. And in this day and hour, you know, I have my own two books that I'm writing right now, okay? And 
I'm writing forwards and you want, you want my forward for your manuscript and you want my paragraph. You want me to write your paragraph on the back of your book. This is what sells books. You have to learn business. Your forward sells your book. So every time we write a truth and it's no fake news and you can substantiate and eradicate this wandering, where are we, where are we? We're all over. And so my work is to give you something to work with. So yes, the answer is yes. And you scholars have to come forward. Hey, write your book, design your own book, do the whole thing. This is what it's gonna take. When can I, you can find me on LinkedIn. I answer everybody. I answer everybody because nobody was there for me. Just go to my LinkedIn. I, I gave, you can put my LinkedIn in the chat and I'm a right now lady. If you see the green light on, I mean, yeah, you can make an appointment and you know I'm God busy. But if you see the green light on, you catch me now. Say, Miller, can I talk to you? And I'm like, yep. Because if I'm online, that means I got a spare moment. I'm checking LinkedIn, I'm checking Instagram. And so on Instagram and LinkedIn, if you see green, just hit the contact, Zoom contact now, and I will talk to you. Okay? And I'm leaving these footprints. Every lecture I give is on YouTube. Everything I've said, I'm just leaving you footnotes so that you can begin to do the work. It's just not these two or three blogs on Google. Okay, it's in the card catalogs, it's in oral traditions, and I'm finding the clippings. Look, I look for stuff. I look for stuff where people don't even think to look. Okay, one place, let me give you a tip where I look. The Negro photographer, the Negro photographer, he shoots the funerals, <laughs> his archives all, you want to see our community? The Smithsonian has Addison Sterlock's archives. You have to know the Negro photographers of the region, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Baltimore. They have the stories recorded and their archives are picked up. Okay, I found Moselle at Carnegie Mellon. Okay, and oh, by the way, my white and Indian people, they migrated back and forth doing steel work from Farkey to Pittsburgh. My whole family, I'm looking for Moselle and I find the whole Holmes family in Carnegie Mellon, Negro photographers archives. He's, he's, he's documenting the church. He's documenting the church events and the barbecue. Okay, the NAACP organizations. He's, he's, doing, he's doing the funerals. Okay, so I look in Negro photographer archives and I find, I find the story of black artists. A lot of it is doing forensic work, looking in places where if you are Negro, you know who's recording us. You know who's recording us. And it's not white folks recording us. So don't even look there. <laughs> who, who ever heard of this? Where, what was it? Who ever heard of this? I just happen to know Ted Shear, okay? But who ever heard of the New York Age Defender? The Amsterdam News. Dorothy tells me, girl, I had to go to the, she writes, I had to go to the Amsterdam News to find out what happened to my friend. 30 days, he jumps out a window. The Negro newspapers, you gotta, you gotta dig. You have to dig. And you know, because I'm old enough to have lived through Jet Magazine, is my aunt. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> one, of my, one, of, one of my family friends we call aunt. Okay, to live through Negro social life, you know, you know who's telling our stories. And so Moselle, I find him in the Negro newspapers. The pr proud, went to Pratt, I mean, went to Parsons, won a scholastic uh, art award, studied in Europe. And the Amsterdam News, December 7th, 1969, go find it. December 7th, 1969, Amsterdam News gives you the story of him jumping out a window before this show. Okay, so I'm doing the heavy lifting to try to get you enough footnotes so that you can write. 
and decolonize and do the work of the revisionist historian and throw some critical race theory. I just gave you critical race theory. All of this happened while they killed Martin Luther King and I'm trying to go to art school. No fake news. I'm telling you the truth so that you can make a difference. I'll take another question. I'm here till I'm, till, I'm, here till I'm not, okay? That's the way this goes. Thank you. Well, that actually touched on a question of, um, you know, what folks can do if they're looking to do their own research and documentation. So you kind of, kind of answered two and one there. Um, we have another one who would love to take you up on a hand dancing lesson. Oh, um, listen, but- <laughs> I'm a Tina Rama girl. I'm a Tina Rama girl. Um, the question is, um, how can organizations that are run or led by white people um, be better allies and help mentor Black employees and support them in the ways that they need? Welcome, invite, come for us. Every city has a pocket of Black designers, okay? AIGA, go find them. Go find Tiffany Ricks, Atlanta. Go find David Rice, Philadelphia. Find us and invite us and be, do not be performative. Do not be perform. mean it, invite us. Listen, in this season of pandemic, I would not be here today. I was stuck in the card catalogs and I have had beautiful allies Cheryl, you do not belong in the card catalogs. We're gonna nominate you. We're gonna lift you up out of the muck and mire of this history. We're gonna pull you forward. And everybody knows who you are, so I thank you. Cause I was left in a card catalog. Doing, I love it, I love it. I, I didn't know anything about you. I said, no, I've only been doing this for 50 years. So who's missing in action? So what you can do is invite, because I don't go unless I'm invited. Because I've learned I can knock, I can ask, I can seek. And unless there's a heart to want to grow and collaborate with new people and new things, and, and to look at the truth, look, Here's the truth. This right here, this is, this is about two paragraphs in my book. It starts with 2012 Pew Report, explaining why minority births now outnumber white births. I start telling you this forecast, telling everyone to watch out for this and that the platform of school and academia and the student, everybody was gonna change. But now all of a sudden, since 2012, now everybody's panicking. 2020 census data shows white population in the US declined for the first time on record. So if you don't deal with the fact that there are fewer white folks in America than ever before in history, then you tell me what's gonna be the future of your college admissions. And you've got white men teaching the same Eurocentric white pedagogy from, and canon with these babies who are gonna grow up. And I did a t- Toni Morrison trick. You know what Toni Morrison does when she writes? Her first sentence, they died, she died. My first sentence in my book, there ain't gonna be no white, co- no, there ain't gonna be no white students to teach. And I've been telling everybody, be prepared, be prepared, get prepared. And now we are here. The alpha, I think it's the alpha generation. The alpha generation. In 2016, I visited um, University of Bridgeport has a design school. And I went to give a lecture after an AIGA um, event. I met Alex W. White who was the chair and he invited me to come. I, 
I could not believe the classroom. I said, Alex, can we have coffee? I have a, I said, I don't mean to be crass or anything. Can we have coffee? So, you know, within the week he met me and I said, Alex, I, I, you gotta help me. I said, I, I really i am trying to understand. And I wrote, I wrote his interview in 2016. I said, there were no white kids in the class, Alex. I said, to be quite honest, I don't even know what races I was looking at. Race, creed, or color. I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the race of the children that I lectured to. He said, Cheryl, most of the students, he says, I don't have any white students. I have very few white students. They're all international students. And I'm like, okay. I said, but where are they from? I can't even recognize. I mean, it was so, everybody was so mixed. They were so diverse. And I'm like, is there a white kid here? This was 2016. And so now we have this frustration and tension on Instagram where the community that's being educated by Eurocentric white men out of one book are not tolerating it. And we won't change. So if you want to keep your tenure, and now the international students, if they go, they can't come back. Thank you, COVID. You can't lean into this. We have to work together to address a new demographic of a new design platform for a new sophomore class. I'm here to change the sophomore professor, the, the sophomore professor's content, and the sophomore class. I'm at the University of Texas, and they are letting me develop, I've developed two classes, one, um, one to my book that I'm writing, Graphic Design Decolonized, specifically I take on the canon. And then I'm doing branding for diversity. Branding for diversity is I'm, I'm promoting right in this pandemic, you better be able to design on a team through Zoom and come to the table of being able to give diverse solutions to a global market and be able to do international design too. This is the moral. We do it together. It's a must. It's a must because honestly, a lot, of, a lot of the canon and academia don't understand the projects, the design thinking for the projects, okay? Global nuances in culture. Incredible storytelling, raw, truthful, and it doesn't fit a grid, people. It doesn't fit the grid. Next question. So I'm inspiring us to go together. <laughs> we have to. So welcome. Don't be afraid. Don't resist. You know, don't resist. Call me. I, I help everybody with this. <laughs> I can't teach everyone <laughs> everywhere all the time, but I can help. You know, a lot of times it's, Cheryl, you, you know, you, do you know, do you, you have any friends who could be chair of a department? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> but they're not going to be in places, you know, they're not going to be in places that you expect, you know? So, but if I send you somebody, trust me, trust me. They're going to be, they're going to be cut from the same cloth, maybe different ends. But if Cheryl Miller sends, <laughs> if Cheryl Miller refers, okay, trust me, there's talent. And so you gotta invite us. You have to invite us. Okay, welcome, diversity, equity. Listen, it's diversity for me, it's design justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, not equality. Equality was my era. Equity is give us some money, pay us well, don't misuse us and don't act like we don't exist. And to my community that has to compete, stand up. If you went to design school, you went to you went, stand up, advocate, open your mouth. Design thinking, you got an idea, stand up and say you got the winning idea. 
Cheryl Miller does. God knows I do. <laughs> I'll be the first one to tell you. I'm the only one in town. Say it. Be the difference. And stand behind your work. Okay? This is, it's not perfection. It's ex excellence. It's not perfection. It's excellence. Raise your own bar and meet it. Next question. I'm here till they're done. Well, we actually, we got a lot of shares for you. So I want everyone to know that I am saving the chat and I will pass it on to Cheryl so that she can make sure to see all of your little notes that you um, sent through to the, the hosts and the panelists. So quick note on that. We'll do, uh, we have one last question. Um, sure. Great one to end on. And um, just given everything that you've told us tonight, everything that you've shared, what is it that motivates you to keep showing up? after this this long and to just keep going listen um the grace of god i'm not done until i'm done you know you just i got on destiny's path i'm called to this and when you're called to it you get up every day and you do it until it's done and don't think for a moment I haven't wanted to walk away because I'm not above the law and the abuse. But I was not one day was I ever going to let it stop me. And right now, when I find these truths, I go to sleep at night like, oh my God, I got to tell somebody. I got to tell somebody I found this and that it's documented. I got to tell the, I got to tell the truth every day. Every day I have to tell the truth. And that's what that's what keeps me going. I find stuff and I'm like, I gotta tell you the truth. It wor it worries me to it's been lost so long. So many things that I discover, they've been lost so long. It worries me. Okay. I gotta write it, I gotta tell it, I gotta lecture it, I gotta record it. You know, somebody will find it and dig deep and and you know, Cheryl, what do you think? And I'll say, go over here and research you know, send me your manuscript, I'll look at it, blah, 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 blah. You know, I can't do all this work by myself, you know, but I get up and I know what I have to do. What I have to do right now is get all of these data points in place as best as I can, because there's more than the Google search. There's more than the Google search. And I'm doing everything I can do to get the data in a place where people can find it so the next generation can write it. No more wandering around, where are we? We're right here. I don't want to see another question, where are we? We're right here. So if this is my life's work. I'm on destiny path. I've been here. I'm called to this. I've been doing this my whole life. I don't know anything else. And I talk to everybody. And if there's something I can say or do to mentor, you know, um, I touch everybody that finds me. It's all I know to do, guys. This is it. And we're here. And when this is over, I got to come hand dance and get some crabs. Okay. We'll take you up on that. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much. I know I can speak for everyone in saying thank you for sharing just your knowledge, your truth, um, and being so generous with, with your time and with uh, being willing to collaborate to talk to everyone. Um, it's the best, such important work. Um, yeah, the best, place, the best place to find me is LinkedIn. And then after that, Instagram. I'll talk to you. Good to know. Okay. I don't think we have your Instagram, but I did put your LinkedIn in the chat. And I do, there is a lot of, there are a lot of ways to, to interact with you on LinkedIn um, after yeah. looking through it. So yeah. Yeah. And I'm, 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 um, I will, I'll write for you. So people are doing their books, you know, I will do a forward, I will do back paragraphs, you know. So I do contribute. And that's what I'm doing right through here. I'm writing, I'm, I've got my own manuscripts. And I'm reviewing manuscripts. I'm I'm doing editorial work, and I'm 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 teaching at UT and 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 Howard. Okay, so um, you're gonna find me writing, and I'm doing. I've got my own books, but I'm trying to make sure you all have everything so that you can do your books. All right, and then I'm taking. You know, um, yeah. Well, I speak. Of course, I'll speak. 
<laughs> in order to do is run my mouth. Okay, so, you know, I'm doing commencement, I'm doing special events, I'm doing stuff for the kids. It doesn't matter. If my schedule is permitting, you know, I come. Just look for my green light and I thank you. Nicole, you guys have been professional. Danny, thank you. Um, Wanda, everybody, Eliza, the whole, the whole team, you all have been in the new, a, new, new AIG excellence and performance. Just welcome everybody. That's all. And you got to shake. You got to do what you can to shake the past of the forefathers. It was really rough back then. <laughs> okay, let's put it this way. A hundred medalists ago. Okay, I think I'm one. I think our year, we make the 100 and 101 set of, set of medalists. Okay, back, 100 medalists back, okay? Ooh, it was tough. And so you gotta shake all of that off and, and be a new AIGA and um, welcome everybody to this design table. That's what design is about. Absolutely, great ending. Well, Cheryl, thank you again and congratulations on your awards this year, well-deserved. Um, I will share the chat with you so you have everyone's notes um, of love that they sent. It's just been great to read it all. Um, okay. And we truly appreciate you. Um, and we I hope appreciate to you guys. have more of you. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to hand dance. Just listen. I don't want to dance in a mask, though. If I'm going to do the whole thing and you turn me, are you okay? And you turn me, I don't want to be in a mask. Okay. Right. So, all right. We well, just got to go slow a little bit because I got a 1952 knee. The left knee but short of that i can go go all right and so on that note go go i gotta go <laughs> thank you thank you for everyone for joining and hanging on uh with extra time with cheryl um okay, if you can you. please take our survey uh we we value your feedback we'll drop it in the chat one last time uh and we appreciate everyone being on we hope to see you at some other aiga dc design week events thanks everyone <laughs>